One of the challenges of sitting in a room like this all day and listening to these amazing stories is that by the time you get up here and you have prepared remarks, you don't want to use any of them. So let's go off the cuff here for a little bit. Those of you that have cell phones in the audience for a minute, just take a minute and pull them out and hold them up. Okay, I want you folks to look around for just a second. Look at everybody that's got a hand up in the air. You can put it down because you'll start to cramp. It's late. We've been in here a long time. Drink water. Imagine now what would happen if in that moment I asked you to raise your phone, it rang. And it was a family, a friend, a loved one. And they said, I got a problem. What do I do? How would you answer their question? What would you say? Would you know what to say? Would you know where to direct them to get help, to seek care? How would you respond? Now, I want you to take that scenario, and I want to ask you a very blunt question. What is your vision for the future for mental health? What is your vision? If we're going to move to action, my friends, we have to have a vision. Trying harder is not enough. This is not simply about trying a new program and seeing what sticks. This is fundamentally about redesigning our concept, our construct of health which you've heard from this stage all day, includes mental health. We have a problem on our hands, my friends. In the 12 minutes that I'm going to stand up here and talk to you today, three people in this country will die from drug, alcohol, or suicide. Three. That's unacceptable. In a country that spends 18% of its gross domestic product on health care, and we have some of the most horrific outcomes that we can imagine for mental health, What's the vision? What's your vision? Let's take this call to action and let's move it forward. I'm going to give you five principles. We're in a church, so you're supposed to give three. I'm going to give you five. <laughs> I think these are important, and I think these are actually somewhat instructive for how we might be able to push this effort that you've heard about today forward. Number one, we need to create a generation of fragmentation fighters. Now, yes, I said the F word. Fragmentation, you've heard it already. Fragmentation single-handedly hurts people every single day. The cruelest irony in all of healthcare is that the more problems you have, the harder you have to work. That's not justice. That's not fair. We need to create a generation that expects integrated care, that expects that people talk to each other. When you show up in a clinician's office or your school or your church or wherever you show up to talk about what's going on with you, you know what happens next. And that the people that are there taking care of you, they talk to each other too. The next generation, the people that are going to stand on my shoulders, on your, your shoulders, they will have a vision for healthcare that is much more seamless and integrated than what we have right now. How do we let them know that things are broken and that there's a solution to fix it? I'll tell you right now. Most people think that everything is fine and dandy in healthcare until they get sick. Look at the surveys. It's pretty clear. Healthcare is great, it's wonderful. And then you have the problem that phone rings and you don't know what to say. How do we create the next generation to stand up and fight for something that's truly integrated about the whole of health? Number two, we passionately need to pursue prevention. Not just in terms of the word that we throw out because we're supposed to, but truly look at how we can invest upstream. How do we create a culture of upstreamists where everything that we think about is how to prevent, not how do we respond? Because my friends, the problem is that we jump from crisis to crisis. There will always be a next crisis. There will always be another fire to put out. How do we collectively come together and recognize what are the areas that we can today do something about to prevent it from happening tomorrow. That's a hard thing. We don't prioritize it, and we sure don't always invest in it. But it requires us to have that vision that I described at the beginning. Number three, we need courageous and visionary leaders. This is a tough one. Each one of you are democratized. The moment you raised your hand with your phone in it, I democratized you. You didn't know that yet. But you are a leader. And it is up to you to do something about this issue, not just the people on stage, not just the people that have the privilege to stand at a podium and get to bang on it like this, but you. And it begins in very simple ways. It begins with turning to the person next to you and asking how they're doing, but mean it. 
It begins with going back home to your family and saying what you learned today. It begins with something as simple as questioning the policies that your work has when you don't necessarily feel so good and can't come in that day. All of these things require leadership, and they require you be courageous. But I want to give you a warning here. You're up against it. 1984, Paul Starr wrote a most amazing book called The Social Transformation of American Medicine. And the first sentence of Dr. Starr's book says, the dream of reason did not take power into account. There's a power issue at play here. Because if it were reasonable for us to do everything we could tomorrow and change it so that folks that needed care could get care, we would have done it. But I'm telling you kind of the real truth about Santa Claus here, I hate to do it, but healthcare is really, truly a morass of competing business interest. And we have to recognize that and we have to do something about it. That requires leadership. It requires the, the ability for someone like myself to work myself out of a job to say, yes, I'm doing what I can do to make a difference for mental health, but you know what? I don't want to be doing this job in 25 years because I want to fix the problem. That takes courage, visionary leadership. Number four, and this is uh, arguably, again, one of the most difficult things that I think we will, we will have to face together, is that we have to be create some type of resilient strategy for our communities. We have to recognize that very little of what impacts health is health care, much of it is social. And I could give you a thousand stats here, and I won't give them to you. Let me just give you one around employment. People don't have jobs. If people don't have the ability to afford a place to live, food for their family, they get sad, they get lonely, they feel increasingly despair. And the stats, no matter how you break them down, no matter where you break them down in this country, for every 1% unemployment in this country, we have 3.6% increase per 100,000 people of drug overdose deaths. You tell me that that's acceptable, because it's not. People need to be taken care of, and we need to see health as what it is, the foundation for achievement. Not about the absence or presence of disease, not about big, beautiful buildings that we can go to and seek care, but truly about doing what we need as a community for what we feel we need to succeed for our lives. In some communities, this might simply be a sidewalk. In some communities, it might be the fact that the housing is, is falling down around them and they need to feel safe. Safety is one of these things that we don't talk about very much because it doesn't fit discreetly into a category of health care. But my goodness, folks, those of you that have had the opportunity to be clinicians or even just turn to your friends and family sitting next to you and you say to them, well, why don't you just do this or why don't you just seek care for that? And they tell you it's because I'm more worried about putting food on the table or my house falling down. Are you going to prioritize taking that pill or doing that other thing? No. You need to do what's right for your family and you need to do what's right for you. Health is the foundation for achievement. Now our challenge, and this is all of ours to own, is that we advancing this movement must recognize that movements all have a half-life. We must also recognize that movements can't be owned by any one organization or person. Hence why the democratization of you and us rallying together brings us to a place that we can have collective action. If we had another 17 hours and we just walked the mic around the room, each of you would tell a story of innovation on how you've addressed mental health in your community. And we should listen to those stories. We should elevate those stories. But what's happening is that we have disconnected brilliance. Each of you are doing amazingly awesome things and they're not coalescing in such a way to drive us to action. That's what the movement's for. The movement brings those stories together in a formidable light and makes us have some type of opportunity to push for something different, for something bigger, for something bolder. None of you in this room are gonna feel satisfied accepting status quo. Each of you have a responsibility to push for a revolution. This movement will absolutely happen with you. Because if it, you're not at the table, it's not the movement. 1963, a wonderful report came out called Communities of Solution. Look it up. Folsom Report was actually what it was called. And in that report, the Folsom's, that Folsom Report highlighted the importance of listening to community. It said, we have a healthcare problem, 1963, remind you. And we need to bring together community, healthcare, education, all the pieces that you've heard about here on stage collectively. 50 years ago, 
this was identified as what we needed to do. 2018, we're still having the same conversations. What's different now? Well, I'll tell you what's different, and this is what gives me hope. I'll go back to what I did at the very beginning of this. Each of you held up a phone. You are connected in ways now that we've never been connected before. Look what happened with Parkland. Look what's happening now in other issues. Mental health reform, everything that we are doing in this room is an issue of justice, that we should be demanding something different. What happens if the most powerful action you can take is to pull this out? It's a tweet, it's a post, it's a hashtag, it's a phone call, it's a text. I don't care what it is. Every time you bring this issue to light, you change the conversation. Changing the conversation, remember, language changes culture. You wanna change the culture of health? You want mental health? You want disability? You want all the things we've talked about to be a part of our vision for health? You change your language. Start today. Start today. We rise, we rise, but we need to rise by talking to the folks that aren't in this room. No offense. I, I love preaching the choir. That's what we do on Sundays, right? So we, but I also know that there are a vast number of people out there that every single day do not get at all what we're talking about. Somebody's going to look at you tomorrow and say, what did you do last night? Did you watch that game? Well, no, I went and sat in a room and listened to people talk on stage about mental health. What do you mean mental health? What's that? And you have an opportunity. Change the conversation, change the action, drive us towards something different. A new vision of health will be built on the back of your vision, not mine, yours. I'll close with one quote, and I really want you to think this through. Winston Churchill famously said, history, history will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. it. It is somewhat funny, but it's also very true. This is your legacy, my friends. You inherited someone else's legacy, and we're pretty much today lamenting how broken it is. What legacy will you leave behind? Think it through. If you don't know what that is, if you don't have that vision of what it's to become, you're not going to rewrite history. You're definitely not going to rewrite it. You're not going to write it either. What history will you write? Thanks.